the density was extremely high for the uh, Eastern Tuesday period. The reasons I think are fairly obvious. So many of the bonds fell on poor quality, densely populated working class housing, especially in the north of the city. And these provided little or no protection. Uh, and you can see that in the casualty statistics. For example, um, 315 men were killed, males were killed as a consequence of the rape, 243 women, 54 children, and also 163 were unclassified. In other words, their bodies were so badly mutilated, it was impossible, impossible to identify or distinguish male, female, etc. Also, the fact that so few were injured. In this way, either you were killed or you were, you were that was the most likely one. 120 safety injured, um, which was a, out of all proportion to the numbers that were, were actually killed or died. Very few people have died in hospital. The uh, Commonwealth War Various Commission lists suggest there were 50. In other words, people have died in their houses, in shelters, in the streets. All the reasons for the high death rate, the supply of public shelters, inadequate supply, so few people had been evacuated from the city over half, and roughly half of those who were killed were women and children. Also, the inadequate defences from the city. Um, at 145, the anti aircraft guns fell silent, damaged the, this was because a bomb caused, caused damage to the telephone exchange, the telephone house, the May Street disrupting the radio signals between the gunners and their control room so they could no longer receive plots of the position of enemy aircraft and they were ordered not to waste ammunition by firing speculatively into thin air. Sometimes suggested that it was the furious, the HMS furious, the aircraft carrier during the war, which had saved the shipyard. We get that even in contemporary diarists, that nearly within days of, the, of this attack. That presumption in relation to Easter Tuesday raid had absolutely no basis in fact. On the 17th of April, Commander M.B. Lang, who was second in command on the Furious, wrote a report to the Admiralty. And he said that, talking of the, ship, of the Furious, the ship's armament was urged to augment the shore defences. But he was on, just one barrage was fired, as the guns could not be brought to bear. He doesn't say why. <coughs> One can speculate. Certainly, the problem had been resolved at the time of the uh, 4th of May raid. The death rate was high, so also was the level of crash evacuation. Both of them were unexpected by the government. Something like 100,000 like 100, people had fled from Belfast by, uh, within the week following this raid. 5,000 of them had reached Dublin by 25th of April. After all, as John Blake says uh, in his official history, no other city in the UK saved London had lost so many of her citizens in one night's raid. John Laffey, who was a British representative in Dublin, was in Belfast just after this raid in, in London the following night, and witnessed a major, major raid there. He said that things in London were better than in Belfast. Things were able to resume their more or less normal course the following morning after the big raid there. But not so in Belfast. He felt it was more horrifying because of the number <coughs> of small dwellings of poor people that were destroyed. Again, it was likely that the Luftwaffe would return. Lord Hoho said that if the Belfast people times to bury their dead before the Luftwaffe would return. There were, again, persistent, incessant uh, red warnings in Belfast. Uh, the Luftwaffe would have known from reconnaissance aircraft that they'd missed their primary targets. Belfast would therefore remain high on the list of targets to be struck. And the pattern of Luftwaffe bombing was continuing to be directed more or less at the Western ports. Not much could be done to uh, improve Belfast's defences in the time which uh, remained before the Luftwaffe did return. One thing was the blackening of Strong, uh, it was blacked out, cinder, cinder was strewn on the paths, which was thought to be a target, and also to be likely to be a, a marker for other targets. In addition to that, the, the Belfast Zoo, the dangerous animals were the thawing. Uh, uh, and also there was some marginal increase in the number of anti-aircraft guns from 22 to, 22 to 28. Belfast experienced its last major raid on the Sunday night, 4th of May, uh, sorry, 4th of May, sharper, more intense than Easter Tuesday, beginning at 1 o'clock, lasting for less than three hours. 
two hundred bombers were involved. Clear night, very few flares were dropped. Um, more or less all Easter Tuesday squadrons were back, same squadrons back again, but with some additions, particularly of um, some of the elite squadrons, Camp Group of One Hundred was one of the elite pathway friendly squadrons. They dropped two hundred and forty tons of high explosives, hundred thousand century bombs, and hence it's aptly named and referred to as being the fire raid. Outside London, never so many incendiaries were dropped in a single raid. Uh, and really it was the east, centre and north of the city which bore the brunt of it. Key targets that the aircraft had identified in the harbour area were struck from the outset. You can see this here, for example, um, Harlem Wood. So nearly two thirds of the buildings in Harlem Wood were estimated to have been devastated. The war damage to over Harlem Wood came to something like two million pounds. Again, uh, Jordan Harlan's the aircraft factory. Within literally half an hour of the start of the raid, the uh, fires were reported at Har that Jordan Harlan to be out of control. Similarly, <coughs> City Hall, city centre, suffered badly. The military of uh, officer commanding concluded that uh, the city centre had undoubtedly been uh, out of the target. This is the east wing of the City Hall, the back of the hall and first floor was damaged and also the offices on the ground floor. Um, then uh, here we have the which on Bridge Street, looking down toward High mm -hmm. Street. The only building to survive in Bridge Street was the Northern Big Office, which was saved by firefighters. Um, and similarly here again, looking on High Street, and subsequently after High Street had been cleared, uh, extensive damage. International Bar, corner of North Street, Royal Avenue. Um, the uh, severe damage there at the cathedral. Uh, Lucky to survive, still sore in the two days after the raid had taken place. And also, North Belfast suffered. Uh, Greencastle, or a few more parish par par lines fell there. Some of the biggest properties in North Belfast were struck. Galveston <coughs> Factory with the LMS mills. <coughs> and of course, here, York Street Mill was struck for the second time. Uh, it had been hit on the Easter Tuesday raid. The six-story building had collapsed on Beer Street and Sussex Street, and now again, the biggest fire of the night, possibly the biggest fire in the history of Belfast. At the end of the attack, there were 200 fires. Uh, government, according to government records, 24 of them defined as being engaged with, two of them classified as being uh, conflagrations, and again, help was summoned from Air, from Northern Ireland, and the civil defence regions of Northern Ireland, and from Britain. Death it was much slower. Roughly 190 people were killed in this melee raid. Mainly because the incendiaries and high explosives had fallen on industrial and commercial property in the docks in the city centre area. It was a Sunday night, there were a few people there. Uh, in addition to that, the overtime had been cut after the Easter Tuesday raid, a few months from the overtime on that Sunday night. The defences were more effective on this occasion. Uh, the shells were fired right through the raid and the furious contributed on such a scale that it was later commended by the Admiral. People perhaps more sheltered conscious, also more, more of them had evacuated. Something like, uh, um, uh, so many had evacuated, I mentioned earlier, but hundreds of thousands had evacuated. They, this raid gave a further boost to evacuation, this crash, crash evacuation. Uh, it's been estimated that as many as 220,000 had evacuated from Belfast. Uh, by uh, the middle of May. Um, it was feared that Belfast would be attacked again, and in a confidential comment, uh, McDermott said to Wilfred Spender, the head of the Northern Civil Service, he expressed, he expressed his concern that the local people were so angered at the failure of the government to protect them adequately that they might well attack stolen buildings. One well, interesting feature of the raid was um, that the mission reports by the Luftwaffe crews and in their analysis, they were euphoric. A big contrast from Easter Tuesday. All bar one of their cruise reports claimed to have hit the target area in the docks. They detailed, detailed the fires that had been hit, the ships that were sunk or in flames. They claimed that the vibrations from the explosion could be felt up to three and a half thousand meters, that the smoke pall over the city where Belfast could be seen as far away as Manchester and the West Coast. And you can see uh, the sort of fuss that was made of it is where in the uh, German media 
There were six radio reporters on the Luftwaffe bombers at Kakbelt and in the fire raid, and many also many, many newspaper correspondents. Uh, and this is the photograph is from Der Adler, which is the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe magazine, which devoted a full page of photographs and, and analysis, detailed analysis of the destruction of Belfast by the editor. Uh, likewise, you can see it in focus of the Abachter, which is the Nazi newspaper from 1920. And again, it describes the, it was the only time that Belfast hit the headlines in the uh, German uh, media. Many in Belfast would have uh, accepted the truth of these reports that, that Belfast had been destroyed and was beyond recovery. Emma Duffin, and I put in the previous book, a nurse living in South Belfast records in her diary during the morning after the 4th of May, going into her garden and finding a scorched page from a child's notebook in which had been written, The End of the World. And she commented that it was certainly the end of the world as we knew it. Just for some final comments, Belfast and Pure Raids in other UK uh, old cities, but it had two particularly severe ones, and therefore it comes 12th uh, in a table of the worst affected cities in the UK, compiled, compiled by the weight of city uh, of bombs dropped. It, overall, something like 960 civilians die in the blitz in, in Belfast. That's uh, according to the Home Office statistics. It was actually significantly more than that. Uh, and we can say that with confidence because the 660 does not include military deaths. At the time of the uh, Blitz, there were roughly 17,000 uh, troops in Belfast. Uh, in addition to that, there were others at home on leave, uh, at Victoria Barracks, in Eglinton Street, uh, in, in Victoria Barracks. Uh, very severe destruction there. Uh, it's impossible to know how many casualties to troops. The Victoria Barracks, of course, was the major billets in Belfast for troops. Edmonton Street, where there were billets there, substantial casualties. Uh, Campbell College, uh, something like a dozen soldiers were killed when the military hospital there was bombed. In addition to that, also, something like half the houses, 56,000 houses, were either destroyed or damaged well in the past. Just want to finish off with one final, one or two final reflections. The end of the book, I knew the edition of the book, uh, deals with the impact of the blitz on the morale of the citizens of Belfast, cultural, social, economic, and political, the impact on the cultural, social, economic, and political life of the city. It sets, it, it sets it in its broader context the impact on historic Westminster, Westminster relations and relations between Northern and Southern Ireland. Just a few comments on that. that the, there was genuine sympathy of the in the South and in Dublin for the sufferings of the citizens of Belfast. This was expressed in one way, which was the hostility shown subsequently to Herr Empel, who was the German minister in Dublin. He subsequently, after, in the early May, complained to the Southern government of the hostility which he was experiencing in Dublin women shaking their fists, the abusive telephone calls, his appearance on the streets, prompting or provoking occasional fracas, uh, and also he was recipient of hit mail. One of these he raised with Joseph Wallace here, Minister of External Relations, and he read, May the blood of the tiny children in Belfast call forth the vengeance of God on your innocence. Better that they die, die now than live to realize the state of, of their own values to hell with Hitler. Um, in response to the Northern Ireland's needs, the Southern Government, of course, provided fire assistance in both the major raids. At Easter Tuesday, they were called and summoned at 4 30. Oddly, after, uh, during the May raid, the big May raid, the fire raid, uh, it was arranged that the support should come from the south at 2 30. Before uh, aid was called from the other the seven defence regions in Northern Ireland or from Britain. The reason for this uh, it, it appears to be that the southern that the it was the southern ministers themselves who took the initiative. Uh, when the rape was still at its height, J. C. McDermott's wife later recalled receiving a phone call at her home from them, either from a minister, government minister, or an official, 
suggesting that they send fire men below at once. And ignoring protocol, she immediately replied, tell them to come, tell them to come. Uh, and certainly it was at that time that the, the arrangements were made. The book also considers why Dublin itself was bombed, 30th, 30th 31st of May, the last uh, bombing really to occur in Ireland in World War II. It wasn't because of the Britain's bending of the beams compared to the aircraft over Dublin, or the bombers blown off course from Britain by eastern winds. It was Belfast at all, they didn't find it, dropped their bombs on the way back to their bases in northern Europe. Kevin Cairns, Kieran, in his book on the North Strand bomber, suggests that it was an act of retaliation by Germany for the cumulative breaches of neutrality by Ireland and the aid given to Belfast after this being regarded by him as basically the last straw. After all, at the time of the Easter Tuesday raid, <coughs> Goring, Herman Goring, the Luftwaffe Supreme Commander from 1935, had laid down strict stipulations for the Luftwaffe crews engaged in attacking Belfast that they should avoid overflying neutral areas so that the risk of bombing would be reduced. Finally, uh, the book also considers the impact of the bits on community relations in the North. The loss of family was shared by and friends, and it's shared experience by both communities, both the evacuated, they served as events, forced together, etc. And in, in, in worst ways, for example, the fire raid sheltered together. Founder of the in the uh, in Green Greencast. I just want to finish off with just a short uh, anecdote which highlights this coming together of the two communities with the shelter. It was told me by Jim O'Pagan, and he describes the close links between St. Malachy, since uh, uh, there is an altar boy, and these two Presbyterian churches, between the friendship between Father James Dean and the Reverend Wiley Blue in the After the dockside raid, Wiley Blue was made available in the basement in the basement for those from both communities living in the markets area to shelter. In the midst of the raid on Easter Tuesday night, Father Dean, Dean rushed over to the May Street Church, knowing that a number of his parishioners would be sheltering there. At the door of his greeting by the sexton, kindly man of strict uh, Calvinist, the priest immediately asked him, How is everyone? The sexton replied in solemn tones, Dead, dead, all dead, to sin and iniquity. Father Dean's face dropped in horror, but the sexton continued, all dead, but saved by the mercy and glory of God, and by money. <laughs> <laughs>